Good morning, everybody, from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. I'm NASA's Josh Byerly. We want to welcome you to today's briefing. We're going to be taking a look at the one-year crew. Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko will be spending one year up on board the International Space Station, and this will be the longest time that an expedition has taken place aboard this orbiting complex. Here to give us more details about what's ahead for the crew and the science that we hope to learn is an entire international panel. To my left is Mike Suffordini, the International Space Station Program Manager, as well as Julie Robinson, the International Space Station Program Scientist, as well as Bob Binken, NASA's Chief Astronaut. We're also pleased to be joined from Moscow by our Roscosmos colleagues, including Alexei Krasnov, the Director of Piloted Space Programs Department for Roscosmos, as well as Sergei Krikalov, the Director of the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center, as well as Igor Ushakov, the Director of the Institute for Biomedical Problems. We're going to start here in Houston with Mr. Suffredini. Well, good morning. Uh, as we uh, have said for many years, as we were building the International Space Station, it plays uh, many roles. It has uh, a very uh, large uh, benefit to humanity uh, in general, uh, but also it, uh, it's utilized and will be utilized to advance uh, human uh, exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Um, when we think about it in terms of what the ISS provides to us, we think about it in four uh, major areas. Uh, the first is uh, technology development. There are, there are systems that uh, we would like to develop uh, to allow us to uh, explore uh, in long duration, with long duration space travel. Um, some of those technologies are best tested in the microgravity environment uh, of the International Space Station. Uh, so that's one area. Another area that we um, look towards is system uh, reliability testing. And so there are many systems, particularly fluid related systems, um, that are not, that we're not able to test as well on, uh, on the ground. And so it would benefit us if we could get runtime on those systems in low earth orbit uh, prior to uh, relying on them for long duration uh, travel. Of course, one of the most obvious is uh, the human aspect of it, the human body, the human system, and its ability to adapt and, and um, um, to, to the microgravity environment and remain healthy, uh, not only for the trip, but to be able to do the task required of the crew members once they reach uh, their destination, whatever that may be. And then, of course, to return and, and be healthy uh, upon their return. Uh, so that's a big aspect uh, that's, that we're all familiar with. And then the last one is the operational and simulation benefits of using a platform like the International Space Station to simulate uh, the operations that we would do uh, during a, a transit uh, to, uh, to a distant uh, uh, location. And, uh, and of course, the ISS platform is, is uh, perfectly suited for that aspect as well. So we have, we have over the uh, few, last few years been slowly advancing uh, in these areas uh, on ISS. Uh, we have, um, have been testing some technologies on ISS, uh, particularly uh, testing materials uh, outside the ISS, and you've seen some system testing we've done. Robonaut is probably one of the most famous of, uh, of the technologies we've been testing that have application for robotic operations. We have also been uh, testing some, uh, some systems that may be utilized and can be utilized in the, the longer duration space travel. We have an amine swing bed uh, CO2 removal system as an example uh, in that area as well. And we have other systems that we're building today um, that we intend to fly on ISS and utilize. So one of those is the exploration suit that uh, uh, has been in development for some time. It, it is our, our uh, hope to get that uh, developed and, and on ISS and operate on ISS long enough to have the reliability confidence we'd like to use it uh, beyond uh, low Earth orbit. Um, we have just recently began uh, some uh, work in the operations arena on board ISS where we try to um, build procedures that are more uh, that are more automated or standalone. Uh, many of our procedures assume that the uh, the ground team is there to help the crew, and so we tell the crew when they reach a certain step, talk to the ground. The ground will look at the data and give the crew uh, an assessment and give them a go for the next step. And so what we've slowly began to do is take some of those procedures and modify them 
so that the crew takes all the steps as if they're on a long trip and they don't have really close communications with the ground and, uh, and are able to uh, communicate. Of course, human adaptation has been something we've been doing for some time. Uh, we have quite a bit of data and continue to retrieve data on the, the uh, survival of the human and the, and the being fit when you return after a six month in increment. And it only makes sense that uh, eventually we extend that to longer periods of time to ensure for those longer transit periods we're able to, uh, to survive. And so from that, uh, that uh, with that in mind, uh, the partnership uh, got together and decided that um, it was time to uh, consider a longer duration increment uh, to get some initial data on, um, on how the crews will acclimate. Of course, our Russian colleagues have a little bit of experience in this area. They have uh, four, four uh, cases where they have uh, over one year experience crews or, or to one year to over one year experience. And they have a number of cases actually where they've gone beyond six months, maybe in the 10 month uh, arena. So there's quite a bit of data. But we have also evolved quite a bit in terms of our ability to mitigate the effects of the microgravity environment on the human body. And it would begin, it'd be good to start getting some data uh, utilizing these uh, newer techniques. Uh, and so from that uh, outgrowth came this idea to have the one year increment, the first of what I expect will be uh, several, uh, perhaps not immediately following this one, but uh, I would expect us to have several along the way. Uh, but this first one, which will launch, uh, the crew will launch um, in the springtime of 2015, uh, will allow us to get some early data on, uh, on what it's like for our crews to uh, uh, be in orbit in a one-year time frame. Uh, so with that, um, that agreement with our partnerships, we've uh, announced the crew, as Josh mentioned, and uh, we're proceeding down the path to train the crew and build an integrated um, uh, test uh, that, uh, that both crew will follow uh, through the entire life cycle, uh, pre-flight, launch, on orbit, and return, uh, so that we're able to share the data between the entire partnership and gain the most uh, from this, uh, this first step. Uh, so with that, that concludes my comments, and I'll hand it to uh, Julie Robinson, who'll tell us more about the specifics. Thanks, Mike. We've been working really closely with our Russian colleagues, especially Pro Professor Yushchev and uh, and all of his colleagues at IMBP, uh, to define what that one-year increment would be. That work is still in progress, so we can't tell you today exactly which experiments. But I want to talk to you about the basis for our thinking about which areas are going to be important and for what experiments we will do be doing using this combined crew of subjects. Uh, First, uh, I just want to mention that there really is a long experience, as Mike said, that our Russian colleagues have with long duration flight, and I do have a graphic on that. Uh, you can see that there are four Russians that have uh, had the opportunity to fly more than 12 months in space, and two as well that have flown 10 or 11 months in space. And, uh, but all of these crew members flew really during the early space flight errors. None of them have been to the International Space Station. And in fact, our most recent, uh, the most recent long duration flight of humanity, 12 month flight, was in 1999. And so a lot of things have changed since then. All the lessons of Mir have been incorporated into the International Space Station. And we've even moved on from our sort of International Space Station starting conditions in terms of how we maintain astronaut health and gone to sort of uh, 2.0, if you will, uh, for the exercise hardware, our exercise protocols, our nutrition protocols. Also, medical technologies have advanced signif significantly since uh, 1999. And so it's a, uh, our Russian colleagues came to us and thought it was a good time to start looking at this. Originally, on the NASA side, I would say we had been thinking about waiting a little while and working on some of the, the shorter duration, meaning six-month increments, which isn't really short, uh, problems. But as we talked to them about it, we saw significant value in doing a sort of a spot check. And so I want to show you a couple of very simple graphs that give you a sense of why that difference between six months and 12 months could be important. So what you see here is sort of a representation of the effects of the human, on the human body of being in space. And right now, today, I would say we know a lot about zero to six months due to our experience on the International Space Station. And depending on the system we're looking at, uh, you can have uh, some things where the effect happens very early in spaceflight, and then it sort of levels out. 
and there isn't an ongoing concern. You can also have cases where we think there's just a constant rate of impact, and the longer you're there, it's just a nice linear process. And then there are certain risks or challenges to the human body that we know are there, but we think that they're small enough that they're probably not a problem. Uh, if you look at uh, the graph on the right side, you see a big question mark because we really don't understand with the same level of uh, process what goes on after six to 12 months uh, because measures were a lot different 20 years ago when the last 12 month crew members flew, even as we discuss these with our Russian colleagues. So if I could have the next chart, I'll show you some possibilities that we could discover for different systems. So uh, in that first blue line, that early effect, if things are the way we think they are, we what we learn in a 12-month increment is that we definitely don't have any other problems to worry about. We can just focus on short duration studies to solve that problem. If we have a constant rate, then we know that that indeed problem is going to get bigger and bigger the longer we stay in orbit. And that affects the way that we develop our countermeasures to the problem. Uh, but what's really important, if you look at that bottom line, is that it's possible there are some things that we think are a constant low rate that we haven't identified as a problem and could have a late effect. And if we identify that late effect in the 9 to 12-month range, that could become a significant risk for human spaceflight long-duration missions, and we wouldn't be looking at it today. At the same time, it's also possible that's a low constant rate and it really never becomes a problem. And so this kind of gives you, um, in a, I tried to make it a pretty simple form, but it gives you a sense of what scientists have to think about as we go through the uh, many dozens of risks that we're looking at for human spaceflight and think about what experiments we would do in a long duration mission. Uh, so in working with our, our Russian colleagues, uh, to develop the science plan, we've been having a lot of discussions of different systems. And of course, the key variable is to look at that time period. And although two crew members doesn't amount to a complete study, it does give us a sort of a spot check. So if you see those graphs I just showed, it will give us a sense of if a couple of crew members are up in the danger range on something that we've measured, it tells us we need to redesign our, our programs. We may need to look at more longer duration crew members. By the same token, if uh, things match the patterns we understand, it also gives us comfort in continuing with six-month increments as our primary research focus. So it's a very useful kind of a check for us. So the studies that we'll be doing uh, jointly with our Russian colleagues are going to be in, we believe, about seven different areas of focus. And uh, those studies will be um, jointly executed so that they're done on both crew members the same way. And that allows us both to have efficiencies and to have a little bit of uh, statistical variability in looking at those two crew members. They'll be very similar to the studies that we're doing on the crews right now, which allows us to compare between the 12-month data points and the six-month data points, and even will allow us to compare for Scott and Misha's data to their previous spaceflight experience. And so that's also quite helpful. Uh, the first, one of the first areas that we're looking at, of course, are the vision impacts and intracranial pressure. This is a new discovery that was made jointly over the last couple of years where we discovered that some crew members are having some in, uh, pressure in their uh, intracranial pressure, pressure in their you know, vein system, in their brains, and their spinal cords especially, and that that was causing in some crew members uh, a vision impact that could be permanent on the ground. And so that's one area that we're very interested in understanding because it's so new. Uh, other areas, and I have just a couple of visuals to go with these because I'm just going to mention them at a very high level, but you'll see pictures of crew members on orbit over the last few months doing activities related to these same kinds of experiments. So the next area we'll be looking at is exercise, nutrition, and bone loss. We've made significant um, accomplishments in protecting bone in crew members in a six-month mission, and that's been a problem out there since the Gemini missions, and uh, we now know how to maintain crew bone in a six-month mission, so it will be really nice to see how well those protocols perform in a 12-month mission. And those, of course, weren't available back in those mere days, so it's a very great check for us. We'll also be looking at immune function. That's something where we really don't understand the process, and so looking at what that does over 12 months is important. Uh, neurovestibular effects, the longer that you've adapted to being in spaceflight, the more, difficult you may ha more difficulty you may have in returning to Earth. And so uh, we're having some great um, interchanges with our Russian colleagues about what are the right tests to do, especially post-flight. On the NASA side, we typically do something called functional task test. Our, our Russian colleagues do something as well, and we're looking at merging those together into a dynamic set of data collections. 
Huh. Another area where long duration may be significantly different than short duration is in behavior, performance, and crew interactions. And so there'll be some work in that area, in some investigations in that area. And then uh, radiation biomarkers is an important area because that's one of those straight linear processes. The longer duration you're there, the more radiation you're, you're, you're getting in a very linear fashion. And so a 12-month mission is an important one for looking at that. Uh, we don't really do a lot of focus on radiation biomarkers in short duration missions because the accumulation is low enough that, that we really think we know how to handle that pretty well. And then finally, uh, we'll be looking at training approaches uh, because one big difference between a six month mission and a one year mission, and it's a difference that also happens on a Mars mission, is that uh, you have to train a long time before you do certain activities. And so uh, doing everything on the ground and then trying to remember that for until you need to know that information in orbit is maybe not the best way to train and execute some of those missions. And so we'll have some studies both of how we do operations and, and how we do training to help facilitate this mission. So when we, when we do these kinds of studies, and we're really um, pretty excited about the final plan that we should have in place in the January timeframe, uh, as, as we put that final plan together, I think both we and, and IMBP are really conscious of the fact that as we make these applied discoveries and add more knowledge to our understanding of supporting the human body in space, those do help us with our future spaceflight plans, but they of course also give us information that comes right back down here on Earth. And so it's really a great opportunity for the space station program to get some early insight into 12-month missions and, and what we need to do to get the most out of the space station, both for our future exploration needs as well as for improving human health on Earth. And uh, with that, let me hand off to Bob. Well, thank you, Julie. I think uh, we've had a, a good outline of the use of the space station. We've had a good outline of the science objectives that uh, may be a part of the uh, upcoming uh, one-year flight. Uh, but I wanted to share a little bit with you about the operational way that we'll go off and execute this. Uh, our Russian colleagues may have some more detail to it, but uh, it did play into our, our selection of the eventual crew uh, that we, uh, we named to the one-year flight. Uh, this uh, execution of a one-year mission uh, requires us to do things a little bit differently than we normally do for uh, Soyuz crews. Soyuz crews are normally put together, uh, primarily train as a, as a three-person team, uh, launch into space, and then return together as a part of that same three-person team. They may overlap with uh, some crews on orbit and have to be prepared to do emergency response uh, should uh, that be required on board the ISS, uh, but they do maintain that uh, core group of uh, three individuals uh, throughout most of their training. Uh, for the one-year crew, uh, since the Soyuz is rotated out uh, every six months, uh, they have a little bit different uh, training template, training requirements. Uh, they have a case where uh, two of our crew members will uh, launch on a Soyuz uh, with the Soyuz commander and be a, a three-person unit just for the ascent uh, phase and then the uh, beginning portion of their time on board the ISS. Uh, when the time comes six months later for that Soyuz to be rotated out, uh, they'll uh, wave goodbye to one of their crew members that they've uh, shared uh, so much time on orbit with and uh, join uh, a, a new crew, if you will, with a, a single new crew member uh, while they remain uh, on board the ISS. Later, six months after that, uh, at the 12-month point, they'll return with that uh, new Soyuz commander that arrived with them. So that's a little bit different than the way we normally do business in that uh, our crew for the one-year mission is actually uh, multiple crews. Uh, they'll be executing their, their training uh, for ascent uh, with one Soyuz commander, uh, executing their training for entry with a different Soyuz commander. Uh, on top of that, they'll also be preparing for any onboard uh, emergency response or to execute the mission uh, normally that goes on on a daily basis on board the ISS with several different groups of, uh, of crew members based on the visiting vehicles that arrive and, and of course, as I mentioned, the rotation of that uh, Soyuz commander. So that uh, in and of itself uh, drives our training template to be slightly different for our one-year crew members than it's historically been for the uh, six, month, uh, six months days, which is an interesting challenge and it's a new way of doing business, which is uh, I think part of the purpose of, uh, of uh, the, our activities on board the ISS to uh, continue to explore new ways of, uh, of executing the mission uh, or doing things that are more analogous to what we would do in an exploration uh, mission downstream. Other criteria, uh, in addition to this uh, need to uh, find a crew member who could fit in with several different crews and be successful at that. 
Uh, we needed to select a uh, space station commander, uh, at least on the U.S. side. Uh, the person that we uh, eventually selected uh, will be required to execute as the uh, space station commander for two different increments. That's a little bit different than the way we normally do business. Uh, that crew member was also uh, required to be able to execute spacewalks. Of course, uh, robotics operations, should any be required, uh, capture any free, free flyer cargo vehicles that uh, may arrive. So a wide range of uh, kind of standard requirements on top of uh, that ability to fit in with uh, multiple crews. In addition, uh, Julie mentioned some of the phenomenon that uh, uh, we would be investigating throughout the one year. She particularly brought up the uh, vision impairment uh, uh, and uh, intracranial pressure issue, the VIP phenomenon. Uh, we needed to protect um, from a medical perspective that our one year crew member would not necessarily have a severe uh, manifestation of that phenomenon uh, so that we would be able to uh, have confidence that in a one year mission they would be able to safely execute it. In addition to that, uh, radiation of course is always something that we need to manage from our uh, astronaut uh, career perspectives uh, to minimize the overall dose throughout uh, uh, folks' career. So with that, uh, all of those factors uh, combined, the training requirements, uh, the qualifications for execution on orbit, and then the, the medical requirements uh, reduced our pool of available uh, astronauts uh, to a relatively small group. Having started with all of our NASA astronauts who had long duration experience, um, and whittled it down to ones that uh, had that long duration experience uh, so that they would be good medical candidates uh, and allow us to compare the, the one year mission with their six year mission. Uh, we were able to whittle it down to a, a relatively small group um, and then uh, a relatively small group that was uh, extremely qualified. Uh, of that group, uh, Scott Kelly uh, on the US side was the, the best balance of all of those needs for uh, a one year mission, uh, both as a commander both as a, a highly successful uh, long duration crew member in the past, a successful uh, shuttle commander. And so I, I think along with uh, everyone else has uh, extremely high confidence that uh, along with Misha, he'll make a, an excellent uh, one year crew member from the NASA perspective. I will uh, throw out there that uh, while we're expecting great success uh, from Scott, that's uh, 10 increments from now, and we've got a lot of great uh, crews that are also we're expecting great things from as we uh, as we work our way toward uh, towards the one-year mission. Okay, that is uh, going to wrap up the opening statements from here in Houston. We're now going to go to Moscow and hear from Mr. Krasnov, Mr. Krikalov, and Mr. Ushikov. And friends, I would like to add uh, some comments to what our colleagues have already said. The idea itself of the one-year flight uh, in the Russian community exists uh, for a long time. As they rightly said, we have uh, this experience of uh, long-duration flights. Uh, the uh, last flight uh, of uh, this duration was rather long ago, and we would like to renew uh, this experience and compare the data that we have accumulated with the data uh, that we will be able to get on the new level of development. Uh, first of all, of course, it's medical uh, science experiments and research. Um, during the uh, year uh, 2016. Uh, the second uh, point that um, we um, have the time to maintain station until the year uh, 2020, and uh, the time is short. There are many things that we don't know, in spite of the fact that we uh, have a lot of experience of uh, space flight. I would like to show you a table. Uh, you have these red columns. Uh, the medical personnel are telling us about the risks. So uh, these red uh, squares here represent the risks. You see how many risks uh, there are. 
Uh, so they demonstrate our readiness for uh, the long duration of flights to the moon, to uh, the asteroid, and uh, to Mars eventually. So in this connection, uh, we uh, have um, reached this conclusion uh, that together with our partners and colleagues that we should uh, take uh, some risks upon ourselves, uh, risks connected with the one-year mission, and we'll try to determine uh, the negative impacts that this uh, long-duration flight uh, might have on the body on the human body. And so we are working out uh, the program uh, that has the scientific uh, part to it and also operational part to it uh, um, as a preparation for the long duration flights. Uh, this program is connected with the uh, new technology testing, of course, uh, the technology uh, connected, first of all, to the life supporting system. Systems. Uh, systems of the close uh, cycle, uh, so to say, uh, water processing, for example, uh, the system that will enable to use uh, the water um, again and again, also uh, atmosphere purification systems, uh, systems that clean atmosphere from uh, impurities, also would like to test uh, hygienic uh, procedures. We will probably have to go back uh, to some things, um, you know, that are already almost forgotten. For example, maybe the procedures of uh, wet, uh, wet procedures, so to say, um, cleaning of body and hair using water. I think we should uh, revisit these procedures. Also, uh, a lot of issues will be connected with the uh, rehabilitation of a uh, human body after uh, the long duration flight in space. Uh, so we will have to test uh, some new uh, uh, devices like, uh, for example, a treadmill and other things that are being developed at the IBMP. So there is a whole complex of uh, issues uh, that we would like to test on uh, board the station uh, during one year. Uh, it will be just uh, pure research and also practical uh, tasks. Of course, we understand that in perspective, maybe in 10 years' time, according to our assessment, we will approach closely the need uh, to go to a different level. Low Earth orbit, I cannot say that it is, uh, you know, we have finished uh, researching and testing everything uh, in this environment, but it is clear that we have to go beyond uh, the low Earth orbit uh, into deep space, and uh, it will probably be connected with Moon at first, uh, then maybe the uh, uh, other um, what is like asteroids, so we will try to realize the long uh, dream of uh, scientists uh, to uh, step on uh, something uh, that hadn't been tried before, like Mars surface, for example. So I hope uh, this uh, uh, one-year duration expedition will help us to achieve uh, these tasks. So if you look at these red squares, there are seven areas, and uh, Julie Robinson has already mentioned the areas that we will pay uh, the utmost attention to. Mostly they are connected with the medical issues. So hopefully we will move on from the red to yellow and then eventually to green. Uh, and uh, we will be able to um, meet the risks and to mitigate the risks connected with the long duration flight eventually. Also, I would like to say it uh, won't be the only uh, one uh, flight of this duration. Uh, right now, we are still um, are hesitant to take uh, some other decisions. Uh, right now, we decided on this particular flight that uh, will fly in uh, 2015. Uh, in the preparation for this flight, uh, I think we will be able to 
reach some new goals um, somewhere around 2018. Um, maybe it sounds like a science fiction, you know, to have this very long duration of flight in space and then, uh, you know, uh, that will uh, be in space as long as it is required to reach Mars surface and then to receive them on Earth. Uh, so it might sound like uh, science fiction now, but we are already working with our colleagues. We will try to simulate uh, this flight first and then to send them to real uh, flight to Mars. So I think it's a big, grandiose project uh, that we are dreaming to uh, carry out. But the first stage, the first step uh, for this uh, dream in the future, of course, is the long duration flight that we are talking about today. So I am giving the floor to my colleagues now. Uh, Sergei Krikalev, uh, director of the uh, uh, Cosmonaut Training Center, of course, will add something more, as well as Igor Ushakov, the director of the Institute for Biological Biomedical Problems. So Alexey Boric has already mentioned that the preparation of the crew for this uh, year-long expedition will uh, soon begin. Uh, it won't be very new to us. As already uh, has been said, we have uh, the experience of year-long and even uh, uh, longer expeditions. The first flight took place uh, during the Mir expedition when Yuri Romanenko, the father of Ram uh, Roman Romanenko, uh, who is uh, the uh, member of the Cosmonaut Corps uh, now. So he spent 11 months on uh, the station, and also Avdeev flight uh, was over one year. Polikov also, uh, he is a, um, he has um, made a record, stayed uh, 14 months on the station. So it won't be altogether new for us. And the preparation that is uh, going on right now at the GCTC uh, actually is um, very similar uh, to uh, the long duration of flight that we are planning. But of course, the results uh, of this flight uh, might be very different. Of course, there are new capabilities now that we uh, have at our disposal, uh, also new uh, training devices, uh, new experiments. So we will look at the results. Of course, when we uh, had this uh, long duration flights before, we had different approaches to that. Uh, so we uh, very well know uh, almost everything about the flight of uh, two or three months duration, even six months duration, uh, but not uh, much more. Uh, so uh, during this time, uh, um, a lot of new uh, things appeared. For example, I was uh, talking to American astronauts uh, who uh, just come back uh, from the station, and they used the new a training device that uh, have they have on board the station and they were telling me that uh, the bone mass loss uh, practically um, is not happening anymore but the new issues uh, have arisen uh, since that time like for example visual impairment uh, intracranial pressure and um, so we should study this thoroughly uh, we need to acquire data acquire statistical data in order to analyze that uh, so, uh, I think that even a uh, uh, year-long expedition, uh, you know, uh, just this one year-long expedition will yield a lot of results. Uh, it will allow us to interpret the data uh, that we receive from uh, regular flights, so to say, in a different way, uh, under a different light. And uh, it will also allow us to understand uh, the longer uh, impacts, the impacts that show after, uh, you know, the year-long expedition when uh, 
the crow comes on the, um, in the back. As for the training, as I've already said, uh, uh, nothing complicated for us. Of course, there will be differences uh, here. Before, we trained uh, three uh, uh, member crews. Uh, they were training together. Now we will have to do it differently. And so the uh, configuration of the crew will change, so this will be different. As for the modern conditions, when we have a six-member crew on board, uh, when we have two um, Soyuz vehicles docked to the station, uh, so this is the modern uh, configuration, so to say, and uh, it will be different. And so one crew will have uh, to be prepared, uh, you know, to work with uh, uh, three people, then with some another uh, three people when the crew rotates, and so there will be more coordination and more people to. Um, to be able to interact with. Uh, now, Igor Borisovich will tell us about experiments. Of course, experiments uh, will be mostly medical, but not only medical. Uh, right now, the crews uh, carry out lots of different uh, various experiments uh, on board the station, but uh, of course, the medical experiments uh, will have the priority in this uh, flight. Uh, thank you, Sergei. Dear ladies and gentlemen and colleagues, uh, I heard a lot of uh, very correct uh, comments um, by American colleagues and by the Russian specialists about the necessity um, and about the rationale uh, for this year-long expedition. I think a lot of things will be published in the media. We are here not uh, for the details. Uh, the most important thing I want to say, first of all, I would like to uh, thank our American colleagues that they showed the photographs of uh, the cosmonauts that were in space for a year and more. They all are alive and well today. Uh, their health status is quite good for their age. We meet with them on a regular basis. We invite them to uh, uh, celebrations. Uh, we meet with them uh, during the scientific conferences. And so the flights that happened 24-13 uh, years ago they did not negatively impact uh, their health. So uh, if somebody is worried how they felt after uh, the flights, uh, there are many different details. There is a legend, actually, among cosmonauts. Maybe Sergei will correct me if I'm wrong. When one of the uh, cosmonauts was asked how he was feeling, he showed his uh, thumb. Uh, and when they asked, what do you want? He said, I want to uh, have a smoke and to kiss my wife. So you can judge by this answer that the guy who came from a long duration flight uh, is in a good mood. Uh, although, of course, it was a little bit of bravado. Of course, the long duration flight is not uh, a walk, you know, uh, but a serious um, mission. So, if we start talking about more serious things, of course, the risks uh, in the year-long expedition, the medical risks are uh, higher, at least twice as higher than for the uh, six months duration flight. Uh, of the, uh, we have lots of data, a lot of statistical data. Again, our American colleagues showed us uh, the uh, tables and uh, diagrams. So we will have to see how the adaptation uh, will go on for the crew members who will come back from the Elon expedition. So we know how Scott and Mikhail uh, felt uh, when they uh, flew to space. So it's a very interesting approach, and I think we should apply it. So the risk uh, to uh, have some kind of impairment uh, that will require medical intervention for a healthy uh, person, and our cosmonauts and astronauts are healthy, people is about 7%. So this is an average figure. Uh, 
So it might be some minor illness, but still required uh, medical intervention. So the risk uh, will double. Uh, so at, for, at least for one of the two, it will be 14 percent for the year-long expedition. So we have uh, some increased medical risks uh, for this flight. I would like to knock on wood uh, that it won't happen. The worst scenario, uh, we will do everything uh, that nothing will happen to their health status, but the risk is increased risk for this flight. That's for sure. And the medical support of the year-long expedition, although uh, it was very good before, uh, it also will be different. So it is a flight uh, uh, on a new station, the station that uh, has lots of new models in it, um, and uh, it requires our very close attention. So the American colleagues have already mentioned that the new risks have appeared, like um, uh, they already mentioned VIP risks, intracranial pressure, and we are constantly in touch with our American colleagues. Julia Robinson, for example, participated uh, in the uh, conference um, at IMEMP, and we are all uh, constantly talking to each other, discussing the new problems, issues, and risks. Uh, right now, we warn uh, the astronauts who are going to space even for six months that they might uh, face such risks as visual impairment, for example. So uh, it is very important to study um, jointly uh, these risks like VIP, visual impairment uh, uh, risks connected to the uh, H higher intracranial pressure. Apart from these risks, there are other issues that we will study, of course, and uh, having in mind uh, the long duration flights beyond the low Earth orbit to Mars. Alexei Borisovich um, mentioned Mars uh, 500 experiment uh, that we uh, finished not so long ago. American uh, scientists participated in this project uh, very uh, extensively. A few laboratories participated and collected a lot of data on psych psychology of the long duration isolation. And this data also will be used in the preparation uh, and the carrying out of year-long expedition. I would like to remind you that in the year 2013 and 14, uh, we will um, increase the arsenal of the preventive measures. Uh, it will be new treadmill, also the new uh, resistive uh, exercise device that we will be able to use. And we have joint plans with our American uh, colleagues to use bracelets or occlusion um, uh, bracelets, as we call them, for uh, for monitoring and also Chibis uh, spacesuit uh, for medi uh, remediation of the possible impacts uh, that might lead to the uh, heightened intracranial pressure. So uh, American scientists have this hypothesis uh, that it might lead to the heightened uh, intracranial pressure, and we have to study uh, this hypothesis and uh, will work in this direction. Uh, besides, um, a very interesting issue is the problem of return uh, from microgravity uh, to Earth's gravity. Uh, also, uh, the uh, microgravity on Mars is 0.38 g. It will be uh, slightly different, and we'll uh, need to see what the astronaut and astronaut uh, be able to uh, do, uh, what his performance will be after returning through this partial microgravity. So, as Julia rightly said, Together with American scientists, we uh, thought of a special experiment, field tests. They are quite simple tests that will help us to understand uh, the, uh, what a person uh, is able to do during the first minutes after 
uh, the landing during the very first minutes after the landing. Uh, so it's very interesting experiment, and we will perform it uh, jointly with uh, American medical uh, scientists. So we will be hopefully able to uh, forecast uh, you know, uh, how people can perform in the very first um, minutes and hours after the return. For example, whether they will be able to help each other to uh, doff uh, the spacesuits. Uh, apart from these experiments, there are many other ones. Uh, we have already uh, shared our experiments, and our management criticizes us that uh, a lot of experiments, actually 31 experiments, and half of them uh, will fall fall to the year 2015 and 16, uh, which coincide with the uh, year-long expedition. So the program will be integrated one and um, ideally joined one. Of course, we will choose the most important, most interesting uh, experiments. Uh, and both American and Russian uh, crew members will participate in these experiments. And they will not only concern year-long expedition, but uh, they will also be ordinary experiments that uh, crews do on orbit regularly. Uh, to tell you the truth, I don't understand the opinion of some American colleagues uh, that I heard that some things like a field test, for example, uh, we can already use after a six-year duration flights. Uh, so we can use these tests even after the six-month duration flight. Um, and uh, I, I actually agree with American colleagues who think that we should do this, and we will be able to collect some data. We are not doing it yet after the six months duration flight. I think we, sh we can start already uh, to do this testing. So I don't think we, sh we should not heap all our hopes onto the year-long expedition. We should uh, you know, start doing some ex experiments and tests right now. Uh, I think I have exceeded uh, the time allocated for me, so I would like to wish everyone success in this very important mission. And also, I would like to thank uh, NASA management and our management of Roscosmos that they were able to plan uh, this absolutely new step uh, towards the uh, new level of space exploration. And it is a new level. There are new risks, new conditions, new terms. And many other things that make uh, this future year-long expedition a new uh, move on the way uh, of the flights into deep space. Uh, so first of all, let's wish uh, health uh, to crew members uh, for the two years before this uh, year-long expedition. Uh, they have to try to stay healthy. And I also would like to wish good health to all participants of this conference, which is actually resembles more uh, scientific conferences. Okay, thank you. Okay, we want to thank our Russian colleagues. We're going to take questions now from the media here in Houston, then we'll go to the Kennedy Space Center, and then we'll go over to uh, Moscow, and then we'll go to the phone lines. We're going to attempt to take as many questions as we, as we uh, possibly can. Uh, we're getting close to our end time here, so we're going to try to uh, run through these as quickly as we can. So uh, make sure that you uh, direct your question to the appropriate person, uh, and we'll start over here uh, with Jim. Uh, good morning. Uh, Jim Ober with NBC. That's for Mike. Uh, uh, this uh, is a great program, so it looks, looks terrific. Don't we wind up, though, in that year using one less Soyuz launch and landing than we were paying for? And will there be any kind of financial changes? Will we get any kind of refund or expense that we're not going to make that we would normally have made to launch two men on a six month instead of one on a one year? What is that going to change in terms of how much money you have to spend? Well, you're correct, and, and we've already actually uh, discussed this because of the fact that the payments for those flights actually start uh, started last month. So, uh, no, we get cred credit for the flight we don't use, and then how we use that credit uh, in the future is, uh, is up for discussion. Of course, um, we do have um, 
to accommodate our Russian colleagues or compensate our Russian colleagues for the six-month period of rescue. And when we buy a we buy a Soyuz seat, we also get the rescue for the six months as well. So there's a value associated with that. Uh, but we're we're in discussions on that. And, and as you said, we will we will. Um, um, and or have already started the contractual process of uh, crediting our, ourselves for the flight, for the one flight that we're not using, and we're in the process of deciding uh, what the value of the rescue uh, seat is and taking care of that and then deciding uh, what we want to do with that credit. Okay, one more question for Bob. Uh, at, well, at some point, uh, assuming that Dr. Ushakov's wish that the current two crew members stay healthy for two years, that might not happen. At what point do you plan on working with the backup crew preparing for this special training for this long flight, and also standing by during the mission because in one long Russian flight, they had to replace a crewman halfway through the year-long flight. So uh, when do you, what, what is your plan for managing a backup crew for this particular mission? It's a, a good question. We've had a, a lot of discussions on that. On, on the U.S. side, our expectation is that we would continue to fall uh, the way we describe uh, our backup process as the single flow to launch. And so uh, just like uh, Scott Kelly, um, and his colleagues will be prepared to back up the Soyuz 40 crew. Uh, the follow-on Soyuz 44 crew or 46 crew will back up the Soyuz 42 crew, which is this uh, uh, one year, uh, the start of the one year increment. And so roughly uh, five to six months after we uh, announced Scott and got uh, folks to work on developing the training template for him, uh, we'll be able to get started on the training template for our backup crew member to cover the period of time uh, leading up to the launch of the uh, the one-year uh, crew member. Uh, should we be faced with a, a problem in flight, I know there would be a lot of discussion both on the on the U.S. side and, and the Russian side as to how best to deal with that, uh, either to return the crew or to deal with the, use some sort of mitigation strategy uh, with the help of the, the medical community to try to extend to the normal nominal duration of the flight. And so I expect that uh, we'll have a, a lot of discussions in preparation for any scenario. Uh, you uh, know NASA, and, and we'll develop uh, the flight rules associated with that uh, over the next uh, couple of years. Okay, let me go back here to Kevin. Kevin, Kevin you have a question? No, go ahead. Okay, Mark. Uh, yes, Mark Caro for uh, Aviation Week. Um, I realize there's some uncertainty here in where this program goes as far as whether there would be additional one-year missions. Um, but at this point, what would you like to be able to evaluate b before you commit? And I'm wondering, to, to additional one-year flights, and I'm wondering if in the selection of the backups, you'll be selecting them with the thought in mind that they could do a second one-year flight or redo an attempt at a one-year flight if there was a problem with the with the first attempt. Is that for me? Let's say it is. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Mark, we really uh, we selected this crew with the idea that it uh, that we'd head down this path and um, and we learn with every step. Even just the selecting the crew alone was uh, is a is a big step and deciding the criteria for that, and then deciding what the science experiments are. Um, we have a long discussion about the value of one year versus six months and the, and the amount of data we get from our subjects. And we have a limited set of subjects, so when, whenever you do any kind of research, you need an, a statistically significant N, and uh, the N in this case is our crew members. Um, and so uh, one of the big questions that we're asking ourselves is, and, and Julie talked about it is, you know, do you in six month time, have you reached equilibrium in some respects and so you know the human body will be fine? Um, or are there other things that are yet to come that you don't know about? So we have to balance that with trying to get all the data necessary to conclude the experiments at six months and then go look at the one year because as most of you know, we could probably get to Mars in a six month period. Um, although that's that's a that's a right at the edge of our experiment experience on ISS, so so we have some work to do amongst the partnerships, uh, to, the partnership to, to discuss this further, and we really haven't gone very far. So uh, to to speculate would be a little premature at this point. We've left open the opportunity beyond 
beyond this one year increment, but we're really focused on getting this one started now. It is true that if we decided after the increment that we wanted to do more, you've got two and a half years later before you could do the next increment. So we know we have to have the discussion sooner rather than later. Okay, over here. Wait, we got a second one. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to, Carrie Feibel, uh, Houston Public Radio. I'd like to hear more about what you will be looking for as far as behavior and crew interaction. And also, just a quick question Have any <coughs> positive health effects ever been identified from long term space flight? Uh, let's see. So, the to the first question, um, some of the things we look at and, and we've done in previous studies are the interactions among the crew members with each other and their interactions with the ground. And so we'll be able to look at, um, basically statistically compare what we see in the, those kinds of patterns. Uh, that, that's done by surveys and questionnaires. And, and another thing that we look at is uh, the, um, the, some self-assessments that the crew do on themselves, which helps them to assess their state of readiness, how responsive they are, how, how well they think they would be able to respond if a crisis should arise on a given day. And those kinds of measures also are, are the sorts of things that we can be looking at. And on the positive health effects, are there any identified? Uh, so um, the, really the only positive health effect that I know of that's been identified is um, there is has been identified some positive psych psychological effects because going into space is so cool that that actually um, looks like it offsets a lot of the negative things you might imagine in isolation and confinement. But you know the, our, our bodies evolved in 1G, and so it tends to be a pretty disruptive kind of change. Now it's not nearly as disruptive as people thought before man went into space. Humans went into space. You know people wondered before the very few first human spaceflight if our digestion would work and things like that. So our bodies turn out to be much more resilient than we thought. But Okay, that's going to wrap up questions here in Houston. We're going to go down to the Kennedy Space Center now and take questions from there. Then we'll go to Moscow after that. Uh, just a reminder, keep your question to a one and no follow-up so we can get as many as we can. So let's go to KSC. <laughs> Hi, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press, from Mike Sefredini. Um, could you tell me how many how many astronauts, U.S. astronauts, um, were there um, qualified to be considered, and how how short was the short list? How many numbers on that as well? Uh, well, let me let Bob give you the details on that. Uh, my short list was was uh, that I that I saw was much shorter than than Bob's. So I want to let him discuss that for you. It's, a, it's an interesting question, Marcia, and it, uh, it really leads to at what point were we uh, making the decision. There was a, a lot of uh, discussion in, as to when the actual start date of the uh, one-year mission uh, would be. And so depending on the start date, uh, you have crew members that uh, may be returning from a post-flight period, for example, uh, who may be available uh, given a little bit more time, who would be uh, perfectly qualified for a future one-year mission, but based on the uh, dates that were uh, available for the 42 uh, Soyuz launch, uh, they just uh, weren't quite finished with their post fight period. In the, in the final analysis, uh, based on all the factors, we were down to a, a, a short list of, uh, of four crew members and uh, with, uh, with three folks uh, that uh, uh, were really uh, in their prime for uh, stepping into a one-year mission and were able to select Scott Kelly from that group. You were picking Scott and picking the Russian counterpart. Um, did you uh, pick those both, did the two agencies pick them in two vacuums, or did you look at each candidate and try to get a Russian and an American who would get along and have some similarities? We uh, normally execute our, our, our selection process uh, uh, kind of in two parallel processes that kind of meet uh, towards the, the very end. And so we assess that uh, final compati compatibility with the crew members after most of the selection on either side has been accomplished. And so uh, we had no objections uh, uh, and were uh, confident in our, our Russian uh, colleagues' uh, selection when we got to the final uh, analysis and they were confident uh, in our crew member uh, being somebody who could uh, perform well with uh, Misha. Okay, that's going to wrap it up from the Kennedy Space Center. We're going to go to Moscow now and take questions from there. Alexander Kovalev, Ria Novosti. I will uh, ask the first question. 
out of 10 issues, uh, risks, uh, you know, to the health, uh, one was voiced, actually, uh, the increased in intracranial pressure. What other nine? Can you please uh, name them? I have a table here which uh, uh, represents uh, very well uh, the risks. It was developed uh, according the, to the methodology of uh, risks, international methodology. We discussed this table quite a few times uh, during the meetings of the joint working groups. So uh, the space medicine exists for 41 years. Um, the Space Medicine Commission and has never stopped its work. So the risks are connected with uh, the skeleton uh, apparatus, also uh, movement functions, also ophthalmology syndrome, the syndrome that was discovered on, this, on the ISS uh, by our American colleagues. And it is connected to the increased in uh, intracranial pressure. It's an absolutely new risk that we didn't know before and didn't uh, describe uh, in our space medicine publications. Uh, in a few publications, there was were, uh, were some data by some researchers uh, even Russian publications of the Soviet period, there were some hints on the changes uh, that might happen uh, to the body uh, in space. So we know about these publications. I was shown one article in particular, for example. So the foundations for these risks probably existed even before. Uh, but I think that this risk uh, you know, connected probably uh, to the new combination uh, of factors. Uh, maybe it is even connected to the very effective and intense use of the preventive measures. Maybe also the last drop effect uh, is in work here. Uh, you know, the heightened pressure uh, inside veins and uh, inside the body, uh, so it should uh, raise to some uh, level. After that, uh, some changes might occur. Uh, the uh, phenomenon of edema might happen uh, that will lead to the deformation of, of uh, eye organs, so eyesight organs, and to the um, uh, other impairments. Maybe I'm uh, talking, uh, you know, in a sci too scientific a language, but uh, I think this uh, is a last drum drop syndrome. That's how I call it. Nourishment. Also, the independent medical assistance. Well, this situation actually might happen uh, right now on board the station. For example, uh, an astronaut a crew member might uh, have a scratch, uh, get injured on board, and uh, medical assistance will be needed for him. Also, uh, uh, psychological health, radiation, toxicity, other things connected to the toxic uh, uh, fluids that are on board, and of course, uh, microgravity effects. All these risks actually are quite well known. They are already in test book, textbooks on space medicine. Uh, I think it's a very useful table, very representative. Maybe what is necessary to add to what has been already said, that these risks are increasing uh, with a year-long expedition. And of course, uh, Mars 
uh, represents the most uh, high risks. Uh, Mars is a red planet, and all red uh, squares that we have on this table, uh, they represent uh, Mars, so to say. But these risks uh, cannot be um, evaluated, for example, like 65 percent. Sometimes they are alternative. They exist or they do not exist. One, um, for example, uh, doctor thinks that this risk exists, and another doctor uh, thinks that this risk is non-existent. So they are not typically mathematical uh, probability figures. Unfortunately, they are not. Radiation, yes, uh, we can apply uh, some probability characteristics to radiation, even to gas environment, uh, vibration and noise. All also, uh, we can assess in probability categories, but as for some other risks, it is not possible. Sometimes it's very hard to uh, summarize and generalize these risks. We have to study them separately, but the specialists uh, who are very good specialists in their area will study those risks. It was a complicated uh, question. Sorry for the long answer. Moskovsky uh, Komsomolit journalist asks uh, Sergei Krikalov. So you've already told us that uh, you have year-long uh, expedition experience. So what's the difference between the six-month flight and year-long uh, flight? So uh, a lot of people think that the preparation of cosmonauts actually, uh, you know, comes to running and to jumping and to, uh, you know, other physical things. Actually, a lot of training is done at the desk uh, with tables, with uh, diagrams. And so the person who is on board for a longer time uh, is in different conditions. For example, Titov and Manarov were there for a year, and they were just two of them. Uh, there were some uh, visitors, of course, to the station. Valery Polikov came uh, at the end of the expedition, uh, but they had to know all the systems really very thoroughly, so that in case of any fault or failure, uh, they were uh, had to be able to repair it. Actually, uh, one uh, year flight is not very much different from six months flight. Uh, of course, uh, the crew members uh, will have to have some skills. Um, in short uh, expeditions, of course, we also train skills, but the expeditions for uh, six months, the person should have uh, really very well uh, trained uh, skills. So not much new is in the preparation for the year-long expedition uh, that we do not apply to the six months uh, flight. The uh, complications will be that the crew, the complex issues will be connected uh, with the interaction with the new crews that will come on board. Uh, of course, Soyuzes can be on the station only for a certain amount of uh, months, and uh, they, we have to rotate the vehicle, so the crew that is on board will have to adapt to the newcomers. But again, I think it is quite possible, and we will have to train uh, you know, the emergency situations in the different configurations of the crews. That will be very important, of of course, uh, so in emergency situation, uh, all the actions of the uh, crew members should be very well uh, trained and very well learned. Okay, will we simulate any situations from the flight to Mars? Uh, when we come closer to the flight to Mars, uh, then we will probably have a chance to simulate uh, some of the situation. This particular year-long expedition is not a rehearsal for the Mars flight uh, per se. Uh, we understand it will be a long duration flight. You know, we are developing new engines right now, so the flight to Mars might actually be shorter than we expect right now. Maybe. So uh, the preparation will have to be different as well. You know, there is no sense, I uh, think, to do it for this year-long expedition. Okay, that's going to finish up the questions from Moscow, and that's uh, going to conclude this briefing. I apologize to everybody on the phone lines who did not get a chance to ask any questions, uh, but we are out of time. So if you'll stick around, we've got the crew news conference coming up next. 
and we will attempt to get all the questions uh, in those for both Scott and Mikhail. We want to thank all of our panelists, both here in Houston and in Moscow, and of course, for the latest on this one-year crew, you can always log on to the NASA website at www.nasa.gov stations. Thanks a lot.